Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Modern Web Podcast. I am your host, Rob O'Sell. I'm an architect at This Dot Labs. Today is a special day. I have a co-host. My co-host is Tracy Lee. Tracy is the CEO of This Dot Labs, a Google developer expert, a Microsoft MVP, a GitHub <laughs> star, and so much more. Tracy, how are you doing? Hi, I'm so excited, and I'm so excited to do this like collab podcast with another amazing podcast that I was just recently on um with the ship shape oh wait not the ship shape guys but the uh whiskey <laughs> web and why not guys? got it on my shirt still <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true same so i mean we can throw you awry with that but uh well as we just said today we are talking with the co-hosts of the whiskey web and whatnot podcast robbie wagner and chuck carpenter how are you guys doing today good good Hanging superb rob okay. thanks for asking <laughs> well, we're doing this collaboration, so today we're going to kind of meld some of our formats of our two podcasts, and I know that one of the things that y'all like to talk about are hot takes, and I believe, Chuck, you have come prepared with today's hot takes, so do you want to introduce us and everybody else to what we're going to start with today? What is your vision of the future of the web? It depends. No, I, I, <laughs> I like, as any great as any great developer says, it depends. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so hot takes is all about um, points of conversation within tech Twitter. And that can range, obviously, as we know, from tailwind to milk to everything in between. Uh, I've just seen a lot of information. And of course, they're, they're pressing it hard themselves, trolling everyone outside uh, the folks at htmx.org which essentially I think is another take about looking at more multi-page apps and server rendered applications where most of your logic lives and doing very minimal functionality. And in turn, like leveraging the potential of HTML at its core where a button has, is, a, is just a button and forms are just forms and simply like reacting in these very simplest simplistic ways so my big question is do things like this make us start to think about highly engineered uh single page applications even server-side rendered things but where so much of the business logic and everything lives within the client so do we need meta frameworks that's what i'm asking it's an interesting topic and you know it's particularly for the htmx it's super fascinating I was watching a Fireship video, which came out recently mm -hmm. on this topic, and they were talking, well, it was really about the Twitter rebrand. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to say the new name, uh, but the Twitter rebrand. And they were mentioning that part of the joke was that because they were adopting HTMX, I looked for an announcement or a tweet or anything, even a zeet about this, hmm. and I couldn't find anything. Oh, you so, said it. Uh, does anybody <laughs> know? It, like, has, Have you heard? Is, HTMX, is, is Twitter migrating to HTMX? That I hadn't heard, so that would be in, uh, inf interesting information to me. I mean, I know they have still like quite a bit of old technologies uh, mm -hmm. as part of it, isn't it? Like it was partially Rails and moving over to I don't know a few. Uh, I forget what it moved I think to. They some, use React, some don't yeah, they? some React and, and parts. But like and, literally, why would that be the most exciting thing that's happening out of that company? Like I feel like I feel like uh, you know with this rebrand thing this whole conversation about something about you know digital banking coming to the platform and mm -hmm. i don't know what else but like why would they be focused on a rewrite or migrating any of the technologies when it sounds like they have bigger fish to fry i think that's a pretty grand uh question in terms of overall strategy that no one really seems to understand um i can see from a maintenance perspective possibly a simplification of entire parts of that application would behoove them if you know it was being run with 7500 employees before and now has 200 mm -hmm. employees or whatever it is these Making days it right plus Making HTMX it smaller. has an x in it so exactly so that, that already probably gets his attention yeah so he's he's trying to activate his 2000 business plan x.com comes back mm -hmm. apparently and becomes a banking platform where that people talk about i don't know um but I can see a use case for it in what does it do, right? You like, you enter in a piece of content 
and it renders a list of that content based on an algorithm that's determined on the back end anyway. So do you need true client side reactivity or do you have this thing where it just makes a fetch for HTML to render, continue your list and, and everything just goes through, you know, through the server rather than the client? I don't know. I mean, I could see where that could be helpful architecture, but I don't know what the problems are because we spend time on the platform and yeah. every other day there's something that's weird or wrong or broken. It's the 10X developers mm -hmm. driving it. <laughs> right. Yeah. This, you got to yeah. keep the 10X developers happy. You mean 10 developers at X? The, the, the 10 developers <laughs> that still work at X. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're, they're, they're 10 pause X developers. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, arguably every decision they've made has been terrible. So if they were to adopt HTMX, I think it would die immediately. Like no one else would <laughs> want to use it. Oh no! <laughs> well, we hope that not the case then. Uh, but yeah. I mean, it is it is an interesting approach. Like, so for people that haven't really looked into it much, I mean, part of the idea I won't say it's the whole thing, but part of the thing that's going to hit you when you first look at the documentation is that it's like live in a world where everything's in HTML, um, or at least all the JavaScript part is in HTML. I guess yeah. they are agnostic as to the CSS piece. Maybe we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, it is it's interesting. And I, I think people are going to have like immediate visceral reactions to the syntax and just even the concept of it. But I think when you start to read how they tackle all the different parts that sort of a lot of uh, web apps and websites go through, it kind of is all there. It kind of all makes sense. Like it is actually kind of interesting. So I'm kind of curious, Chuck, when you kind of brought this up, like have you have you played around with it on projects, like on, on anything uh, you know, not completely trivial or anything like that. Like, have you, have you seen this in action? I haven't. No. So there you go. There's the layman side of it. I, I, I more like you, I think I've just gone down the curious path and, yeah. uh, d dug into like more like fragments of, of the web and what that would look like without, you know, a, a meta framework react or whatever playing into it. And what would this look like? But I do think it is, uh, has a parallel ideology to what Astro is doing, right? Astro is also saying HTML is a first class citizen. We minimize what we ship to the browser as much as we can, and we sprinkle in interactivity as necessary. So I think that, and I have messed with Astro quite a bit, um, astro.build for any listeners who are unfamiliar. Um, and again, it's like a nice way to work on projects. It got a great build system, some excellent integrations there. Um, probably looks a little fancier than HTMX, but the, I think some of the philosophies and theories around like saying, the, the web was just HTML documents and then the rest kind of like we got clever in the way we engineered things because we needed to at the time. But it has had me thinking about that for a while of why are we making everything so hard? And sometimes it is hard and needs to be. But let's make sure we're not just reaching for what's comfortable because it was comfortable. You know, it's kind of like the days of of jQuery. Right. We had to add some interactivity. There wasn't uh, much of that built into the browser. And then we started getting like more and more clever with that and making things complex. And then the APIs for the for the web got better. But then we still would reach for our handy tool because it was just like, oh, um, you know, selectors are just easy in jQuery. So we just keep doing that and we have support across the browser wars. And so blah, blah, blah. But eventually you look at that and say, do I still need this tool? And then when you're starting a project, yeah, maybe the last five you started with Next.js or, you know, Ember.js or whatever else. And it's easy to start a project for that because You've, you're familiar with the tool, but just ask the questions. I think that's what it is. It's like, don't grab what's that's smart. Yeah. I like, like that. I'm a carpenter. I, I want to, and someone, I'm going to steal this metaphor a little bit, but like, you know, I'm a carpenter. I'm used to working with wood and the hammer, but I actually need, you know, a screwdriver for this project. Just make sure you're paying attention to the right tool for the right job. Well, I think it's, it's funny because it's like, uh, you know, frameworks and then you know you have react you know whatever seven seven ish years ago eight year, years ago where it's like oh no it's just javascript react is just javascript that's why everybody loves react right mm -hmm. and then um you know and then all of a sudden you know this react ecosystem kind of explodes and you know everybody's like we don't need this heavy framework stuff react's not a framework it's just the library 
And, you know, then all of a sudden, everybody's like, man, we're making our lives so much more difficult with it's just React. We need frameworks on top of it. So then all of a sudden, all these, you know, we're at that stage of meta frameworks just popping up. And then the trend is, well, frameworks make our lives easier because we don't have to do so much configuration. And we, you know, it makes us faster because it's not just it's not just JavaScript anymore. And then now you're kind of having this trend of like modern React being overcomplicated or a lot of people feeling like modern React is overcomplicated. What do we do? And then we're going back to this HTMX thing, which I think is also hilarious because now all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, let's get back to the basics and then let's reinvent the wheel for the next seven years again. Right? That could be the trend again. And then all of a sudden you have frameworks for this. You know, probably Astro being in the the leading, <laughs> leading the charge in that area. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything old is new again, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, Astro, <laughs> I think Astro is doing it right because like it takes it back to what React was meant to be. Like you use it as your rendering part of the app, just the view layer and like everything else gets kind of abstracted away. Most of it ends up being build or static time or like, you know, server side or static, I guess. And so then you're just, if you need some interactivity, you sprinkle it in. Like that's how all of this was meant to be before we decided everything was a component all the way down to the router and like we and that we need a router at all. Like browsers know what web pages are. You can navigate just fine. Like we don't <laughs> need to route between everything. I think it's interesting, right? Like I, I have been, as other people have now, maybe sort of um kind of had that crisis of faith in spas, single page applications in general. And so now when I sit down to think about a side project, I suddenly have that analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. What is the right tool for the job? Like, what do I really need here? And sometimes I've tried to start a project with nothing but vanilla HTML, a CSS and JavaScript until it sort of made itself uh, apparent that I needed it. But it's hard to argue that I'm more productive in that format than I am sometimes using a framework. I mean, there's just so much to know between, and so much that you can get wrong with performance, accessibility, security, all these things. Or we tell people all the time, don't, don't roll your own authentication method. Use OAuth or Auth0 or whatever else. Like people smarter than you have developed these tools, don't try to be smarter than them. I think to some extent, frameworks will still provide that. So I think, I don't know if I see us evolving beyond frameworks, as much as I see us maybe putting spas back in the toolbox and saying, listen, every project won't start as a spa. It's fine to start from whatever your favorite set of tools is, if that's quick, if that's solid, if that's React, if that's Vue. I just love the choices we have these days to fit different mental models, different starting points. But I feel like it's less likely that frameworks will end up on the shelf and sometimes we'll use vanilla and sometimes we'll use a framework as much as it maybe is likely that spas are now on the on the shelf and the meta frameworks have kind of unlocked this ability to use react or Vue or angular without needing it to be a single page application just sort of always had to be and i think so much of the evolution of the web was like the ergonomics of these frameworks are amazing but they forced us down a path that we kind of you know everything looked like a nail because we were holding a hammer and so everything had to be a spa and i think that's what I think has so been so attractive of the meta frameworks. We've all just learned very quickly that like, wow, I don't have to make a spa. And sometimes I just really don't want to. And, <laughs> and we're learning that that's really powerful uh, to, to realize. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of points that you made there, I think, are interesting because I'm just remembering years ago. Well, actually, like two things. I think we're almost in, as Tracy said, like this whole things got kind of crazy. We're doing a bit of a reset and we're rethinking things. And I remember this around like, I don't want to say like 2006 or 2007, where like so much of the web to get interactivity were flash sites. And there was this concept in a talk where they were call talking about like, again, we've decided to apply this to every, you know, every company wants their site to be flash because they want that kind of you know, in your face, whoa, I'm cool. People want to come to my site because there's cool little like Easter eggs and things to do. And he called it uh, a, um, uh, he called it flash turbation, basically. Like the business objective to the side, we just want it to be as cool and crazy and movie like and interactive as possible. Right. And so it's not quite to that degree, but I see a lot of this of like, um, 
I don't know, I'm four milliseconds faster than you and I do this state management thing and that is the smartest, best, best way to do it. I almost think like this is, this is the output of um, an era where front end devs got sick of being kind of looked down upon by back end devs because they were working on business logic and all the smart stuff and you were building UIs and they were like, hold my beer. I got some, I got some shit for you. <laughs> And we will both pass crazy algorithm tests. You know, like some of the people involved in this are, like you said, incredibly smart. There's no doubt about that. And it doesn't make them wrong just because maybe we have a feeling of simplicity because there's got to be times where your framework does absolutely make sense. I just, again, I don't know that we're in a one size fits all and we're starting to ask that question again, which I think is good. I think you're going back to as well, right? Like I still remember... Um... <laughs> I still remember co-organizing an Ember meetup and my co-organizer, I was like, you haven't talked about Ember in a while, come talk about Ember. So he comes and talks about Ember, <laughs> but his whole talk is why Ember sucks and you should actually use Rails because <laughs> screw this crap and Rails is better and you don't need Ember. And I was like, whoa, 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 Mr. Co-organizer. What <laughs> co-organizer of an Ember meetup? Like, why are you giving this talk at an Ember meetup? But I think, you know, his his pain there kind of was this idea that like, you know, front end is complicated and, you know, it's sometimes when you go back into Rails or something like that, you know, you don't have to deal with so many different <sighs> All the different nuances <laughs> i would say that front-end developers have to deal with right so um i feel like it is a little more comfy back there or at least that's how some people feel for me personally if i don't see what i'm doing like i don't have immediate gratification <laughs> mm -hmm. then i'm not excited about what i'm doing right so like i have to be in the front-end world because i need to be able to see the results of my work like in five minutes less than five minutes you get what i'm saying but yeah yeah for sure so yeah I it's also fascinating to see where the industry is going as far as like what kind of experiences people want because they're novel i think that was part of why single page applications took off right we had this ability to do uh, client side transitions of views these very dynamic animated powerful sort of utilities on the web and i think people were like this is cool everything else i click a button i wait for the page to refresh this is such an interesting thing um and what I'm, what I'm, what the reason why I bring this up is I don't know if y'all saw on social media was going around this sort of thing. I think it was went viral in different communities for different reasons, but it was like a picture of a of a of a homepage, and it said this homepage, this marketing page, cost five hundred thousand dollars to make yes. or something like that, right? Exactly. And it was all this wild animations, and one of these extremely long scrollable pages where all the information sort of slides in as you go through it. And, you know, you think about like the parallax effect stuff that people were obsessed with for a little while. And I, I was wondering if this is broadly true that we are going in, or if this was maybe always true, that we're going into an era where I think people kind of aren't interested in that. It's they've seen it now and people like what's what's trendy and novel in a world that's filled with a bunch of marketing stuff and a bunch of overweight JavaScript sites is just lightning fast experiences. The idea that if you have the type of site that I can just get in, I'm seeing things instantly and I'm getting back out instantly, that's going to stick out more than any flashy anything these days. And I think that's maybe fueling this. Again, I think some performance people would say that's always been the case. <laughs> but I do think some people were interested. They, they look for things that stand out. And maybe in a world of bloated marketing stuff, performance really stands out right now more than anything. And so, you know, I mean, it's just like that flash stuff, frame. right? Like it looked cute. It was great. It's not like, you know, you weren't trying to improve what the user saw on the page and that solved it. But then you deal with just things not loading or it being slow and this and that and whatever. And, you know, it's interesting because like what drove the consumer or the user to need this instantaneous feedback, right? It's probably social media <laughs> you know and our desire to just consume information faster and faster and faster as fast as we can um so yeah i think that's what it is right uh i think at first things 
looked amazing in some of these parallax things and it was so different but then when it started to be more pervasive then you get kind of a banner blindness to it it's not cool anymore and i'm annoyed that i have to scroll down to get basic information yeah um and we are a culture of instant gratification so at the end of the day that's what we want more than anything but i think the thing that's funny about this conversation is like you i mean i've always been you know trying to sell people on why performance matters and why you need to invest in performance and think about what performance in your sprints and not think of it as like an after right so you know this that we do a lot of like consulting related to um improving performance right improving experience but uh like i think still to the you know we think it's important and it seems like the industry is moving there but I still don't think like people who are spending the budget think performance is important because they still don't understand why performance is important. They think, well, I want features, I want features, I want features. So it's still very, so maybe this like new trend is just kind of a a way for developers to get what they want from a performance perspective (laughs) without having to like justify performance. Yeah, right. Because like the metrics around that aren't, subjective per se as to what performance is but um subjective as to there's real roi to particular businesses yeah and it is really hard i think for people to i i don't know like it's always been really hard for stakeholders to like see the roi for some reason or understand the roi all right well, we will put this on the shelf for just a second, but uh, before we continue with this discussion, we want to take a moment to acknowledge our sponsor, This.Labs. This.Labs is a development consultancy that is trusted by top industry companies, including Stripe, Zero, Wikimedia, DocuSign, and Twilio. This. takes a hands-on approach by providing tailored development strategies to help you approach your most pressing challenges with clarity and confidence. Whether it's bridging the gap between business and technology or modernizing legacy systems, you'll find a breadth of experience and knowledge you need. Check out how this.labs can empower your tech journey at this.co. That's T H I S D O T dot C O. All right, back to this conversation. Um, so, yeah, so we're, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about this uh, idea of, you know, what are frameworks offering and what are people looking for and what are they getting out of it in this, this for performance piece? Again, I, I do think that the, the future of frameworks is strong. Um, but what I do find fascinating about this time, and I think it's unlike the framework wars of the 2015, 2016, 2017 timeframe is I don't so much see a bunch of these frameworks coming out and competing on who's the best, but more so finding niches and communities that they serve well. And they're like innovating and sharing thoughts. So like along these lines, I know Ryan Carniato from the solid team. Uh, you know, he's been spreading the gospel of, um, you know, their, their data structures and their signals and things like that, which is now getting worked into Angular. Uh, you have the quick team who's basically been innovating all sorts of amazing stuff with, with lazy loading and offloading, you know, expensive third-party resources, which I I have to imagine is going to get picked up by other groups. (laughs) Um, you know, I don't know if spelt kit was first, but everything has a kit now, (laughs) a a meta framework on top of everything. And I, 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 think this is awesome and i love that at least as far as i can tell now the community culture that's built up around it is not a bunch of like oh yours sucks mine's awesome i mean outside of the you know the the angst around is react or angular or whatever one other one dying conversation but like this is a much more exciting period of innovation around frameworks i don't know do you all feel the same way like are you feeling javascript fatigue with all the new stuff that's coming out or do you think that uh, this is different than kind of the last round of this. Yeah, I think it's a little different, but I don't know. I still feel the fatigue because it's just <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I think like if I could write Astro and Tailwind and nothing else and like not care about JavaScript, I'd probably opt for that. But I know that there's a lot of, you know, complex business logic that we have to handle somewhere or reactivity we have to handle with something. Um, so I think we're still fleshing that story out. Like, you know, solid is a, a good framework that's out. Uh, we haven't really used it for much, but like, I think it will solve a lot of those problems when mixed with Astro, but I haven't really, you know, had a 
big app that's allowed me to try that out yet. So I don't know how well it solves those problems. Um, so I agree that like a lot of stuff is happening really fast and we're getting new stuff that's being shared everywhere. And I do love to see that, but I don't know that I'm sold on, you know, it all actually working out well in the end. I mean, it is very much like the, like, when are we ever going to get rid of jQuery on the web, right? Like you just have too many large scale applications that are built on this stuff, too many companies that are already invested, too many developers, like it's gonna take what i mean when did jquery when do we say jquery was dead was that like 10 years ago oh it's, i mean it's still maintaining it i yeah, mean J, jquery and jquery that. ui are, are still great to build the website J off of jquery is not dead but when did when did we say it was dead 2014 or so i think when yeah, like so, a while ago like yeah. when frameworks like where you could ago, render right? total applications yeah i would say yeah, yeah. the angular js era People yeah. But it's still Angular not dead, still. right? I mean, yeah. AngularJS is still not dead, right? Ember is not dead. But Robbie, if you move over to Aster, like, I don't, I just don't know. I don't know what's <laughs> going to happen to Ember. Um. <laughs> well, I think there's, so I think both have a place. And I think if you're building a marketing site and you're using Ember, that's not a good idea. Like, it's a very heavy framework. It's very good for very data intensive dashboards, internal style apps. Like, it's really good for that. It has the best developer experience, in my opinion of any framework, but it is very heavy handed and like beefy. So if you want a quick marketing site, uh, it should be Astro and it should be basically do as little JavaScript as possible. Cause you don't want the browser to have to evaluate that JavaScript cause it slows your page down. So I think there's, you know, times and places for both. And, um, I don't know if there's a story where we could use glimmer or parts of Ember in Astro as like the little islands, like you have with react and stuff, but maybe one day. Yeah. And like we, one potential use case around something like Astro also, because it serves up this like agnostic initial HTML, right. And you can load things in here, or there, you can have pages as routes, you simplify some things. Um, it's, it's potentially a good, if you're looking at micro front ends, for example, right. And you have teams that are having separate projects that you need to unify in some ways and they have their own, you know, favorite tools. Astro is a nice like potential joiner of those. So I don't want to like sell it as not that Fred's paying me, but I don't want to sell it as just, uh, you know, a simple static site builder. Yeah. You know, another one of those, it can be way more complex and the integrations are really smart and their documentation is incredible. So like continue to evolve that story, but to regress a little bit about what Rob was saying too, in that I do think we have a, a, a time where it's not shit potent crap posting on each other uh, <laughs> about frameworks to frameworks. Uh, instead, they're they're helping to push and evolve and share ideas together, right? And they're not, nobody really says they're the right answer other than Next.js because Vercel is incentivized monetarily to do that. But so I don't blame them that way, but you know, there, there are concepts and they're helping press e each other. I can't imagine like in another five years, we're going to, you know, there's going to be some fatigue there and some things will some, there'll be some clear winners that have, you know, the, the community rallies around and, and things go to, but I hope ultimately at the end of all this, one of the outcomes is that we'll stop teaching people how to code in react the, the way that we used to teach people how to code in jQuery. Uh, instead, we'll get back to our basic tools and say, these are the foundations of the internet. This is where you start actually. And then you move into, you know, building sites with other things. Cause I think that's where it becomes more pervasive as like, well, the tool I know is react. So and that's what I have to build every project in no matter what. I don't think about the other implications. I instead like make my thing and I wedge it into all these other places. Oh my gosh. But then we're going back to the, the question that is, you know, the, the, the Twitter fights of, um, you know, learn the basics first do vanilla javascript first don't learn a framework versus you should learn a framework first because it's the easiest way for you to learn <laughs> i don't think it's the easiest way for you to learn i think it's the easiest way for you to build yeah. um i think it's harder to learn with the mm -hmm. foundational tools and or you know the, it's harder to build things with the foundational tools but you mm -hmm. understand more of what these frameworks and libraries give you if you don't just take their sugar and make a thing. Right. right. I think that can be. But in bootcamp era though, right? It's all about what can you build the fastest? Like how do we get you to build 
full-fledged application so you can get a job right now. And and the job description never is HTML with vanilla JS, right? They're like, we use React and we're building applications like this, or we use whatever and we're building applications like this. And they're incentivized to get you hired. So if they teach you basic things that don't lead to getting you hired in 12 weeks, then they don't get paid sometimes. Yeah. So I feel like no one's getting hired right now. So we need to stop (laughs) that stuff because like, (laughs) We're lying to people and being like, oh, yeah, you can do a boot camp and get a job. Uh, No, you can't because people that are senior or have 10 years of experience can't get a job. So don't don't believe that. (laughs) Yeah. But I I, I do think that um, it's going to be interesting to see what we teach moving forward. I do think that the frameworks that are going to survive in this next phase are going to be the ones that follow the model that you see a lot more now, which is kind of marrying the frameworks more closely to the platform. Um, you know, I think you've seen a lot of this with like when Remix first came out and, and a lot of developers suddenly realized they hadn't written a form perhaps ever. Uh, and, uh, you know, suddenly they were realizing how forms worked and actions worked and all the things that the platform uses underneath the hood. But that being said, Remix does this and it still has you use React on top of it all. And, you know, I remember when I first started computer science in college, they were teaching it in C++. By the time I graduated, they were teaching it in Java. You know, okay, some people still believe that teaching someone to code in Java is a mistake because they'll never learn the intricacies of how, you know, memory management works and all that kind of stuff. Whereas other people say you don't need it. You can teach all the core concepts of programming, algorithms, and et cetera with that stuff. And I, I think like maybe that's the middle ground that needs to be found. It's like, can we teach the to- tooling that makes a lot of things easier without um, using tools or teaching things that obscure the things which have to be known in the platform, right? Like we don't necessarily need you to know how Ajax worked, but at the same time, we don't want to teach you in a framework that completely obfuscates what forms are and expects you to, to you know, default cancel, cancel default uh, everywhere, right? And I think that's where I see people evolving now. And I hope that's where we'll rest with education is like, oh, maybe you get taught in Vue, maybe you get taught in React, but however you get taught, the frameworks will be in a position that you are going to be taught HTML, first and foremost, you're going to be yeah. taught those core APIs first and foremost, but you won't necessarily have to write the JavaScript that does what so many of these frameworks do for us. Well, I mean, this conversation just made me realize that, you know, the the grumpy old men shaking their fist at the screen are the ones writing these frameworks because they're trying to abstract everything away for job security Mm. because they're the ones that know and yeah. everyone else doesn't. <laughs> right. I mean, that, <laughs> not to accuse anyone, but yeah, you do have to think that like folks are incentivized to create complexity sometimes for various mm-hmm. reasons. If that is, you know, the, uh, in their own, uh, nine to five or in how they've created a brand personally, or, you know, any number of things, yeah. there's financial incentive to, a, to a degree, um, for a lot of us, right. To not do it. But simple. it's also so sleepy. Like, I mean, I get so excited about these new frameworks and what people are trying to do and how they're trying to move the web forward and, you know, everything, everybody gets excited about different things, right? Like, you know, J Phelps gets excited about compilers, whatever, but like, you know, even when I was like trying to dip my toe into TC39 stuff and I started getting invited into the educating Asian meetings for TC39, I was like, man, this is boring. I'm going back to what I was saying. <laughs> you know? So I don't know. I think, I think, I think development and very much, you know, how kind of React was, became so popular as well, right? And kind of some of these other ones is just what's the bright and shiny, what's exciting me right now? Like what's, what has pretty colors or, you know, whatever it is. So it's hard to say, even though, you know, what, what, what world you guys are envisioning you know, it's a world that you wish. What's the bright and shiny? Like, what is going to be exciting people? Probably another framework. <laughs> Probably another framework. <laughs> yeah. Right. The next Tailwind or I don't know, whatever potential. Well, Tailwind will never die, so there won't be a next one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said we're going to resist Tailwind talk in this episode. Um, I, I bait him, he bites. Yeah. 
uh, well, we want to pivot and talk about y'all's podcast, the Whiskey Web and Whatnot podcast. That's you know part of the reason we're having this conversation here. First of all, congratulations on a hundred episodes. That's a pretty big milestone. Yeah, uh, just no one listened to the hundredth episode uh, because we totally screwed it up technically. No, I'm just <laughs> yeah, the hundredth episode is uh, a it's little a shaky one. on the uh, editing side. Is but, it really? Um, oh. Yeah, we yeah, lost Kelly's... Kelly Vaughn completely. Yeah, yeah, yes, I saw uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. So our editors cut her out and then like any questions that like were teed up by her, everyone's responses had to be taken out. And like, so some stuff doesn't make a ton of sense. And then there's just Chuck and I for like 30 minutes afterwards talking about other stuff because we didn't have a ton of content. So it's a little weird, oh but like, goodness. um, we have other good episodes. I promise. Maybe don't start with the hundredth. Right. Don't start there. <laughs> start with Tracy's episode when she was on, on her own. And then we'll, we'll kind of go from there. But uh, yeah, so it's essentially, uh, we, we call it kind of a fireside chat with your favorite tech people. And the idea is we try a whiskey together and talk about that for uh, a few minutes. But it also kind of greases the social wheels because we don't want to just have someone on and they talk about the same thing that they do on many podcasts. Like, oh, you're brought here to, you're the solid person, you're the astro, whatever it is. And then they give their marketing spiel and we say, thanks for coming on. We instead want to just kind of like dig into other aspects about the person themselves and having drinks kind of open some of that up and opinions as we, we have here on this show, like talk about your opinions on the state of things and where it's going and how you got into the thing you're into right now. And then the whatnot is just kind of, I guess, like this segment to a degree where uh, I'll talk about soccer and everybody is quiet because they don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, uh, what lessons can you distill from a hundred episodes? Like, you know, that's, that's a, that's a milestone, right. To, to just, um, to, to, to just put out that much content. I think, you know, whenever you do this, I know when I first did one of these episodes many years ago, I went back and listened to it. It's hilarious. And I can still remember <laughs> the sheer panic I had mm-hmm. minutes before going live that I would have no idea what to talk about. And so, you know, what, what, what's, what have you figured out that's worked other than the theme, which I think maybe would be one of your pieces of advice is, is find a, a theme and a model that kind of gets you into conversations you want to be having. But mm-hmm. what else kind of things have you learned along this journey that you could share with people maybe that are starting out on their content journey? Yeah, I think, um, I think planning and consistency are super important. Like you don't have to worry about getting it a hundred percent right, but you should think about your format a little bit and you should think about like, how often are we recording this? Are we doing guests or not? Um, you know, how can I switch things up and like consistently get something out every week or or two weeks or whatever? Um, we, we think weekly is probably the best cadence, but, um, if you're doing one and you don't do one for six months, then people will be like, well, let me find another podcast because, and then I, they forgot about you. So like consistency is super important. Um, if you get really good gear, it's helpful because people like those sexy microphone sounds. Um, (laughs) um, like I, I think having like high quality, um, stuff is like half the battle. So it's like people care a little bit less about what you're talking about and more about like, Hey, what's up? I'm on a podcast, (laughs) you know? Um, Yeah. Yeah. But I, I agree. I I echo that ascent, that sentiment, at least, uh, us as the host, I think we have a, uh, you know, having a commitment to like higher quality gear doesn't have to be the top of, of the line, but just things that work well give you a decent voice uh and then i would say uh, again also echoing his sentiment about preparation um you just have things in mind to keep the conversation going and then be prepared for it to divert from that and that's also okay like i like to just keep natural conversation and not like get back to my bullet points if things are going really well already and then just be authentic i think uh you know, getting on here and being yourself, having conversations and just bringing that aspect to it is important too. So whatever that means for you, me, it usually means jokes. Um, but you know, some people are a lot smarter than me and they can really get people's attention with that too. It's so true. Like when you get onto a podcast or something like this, there is almost nothing harder than being yourself. I don't know why it's so easy to play a character. But it can be sometimes very <laughs> difficult to be like, you know, it's like the what do I do with my hands syndrome. You're just mm. like, I don't know what my personality is when I'm thinking about what I need to talk about. So uh, that can be surprisingly difficult, but you, you get better with experience. I, I think I that, found. too. You just kind of like yeah. keep at it, even if you make some mistakes. If you're, you know, um, 
you know, if you're into the concept, give it a chance. You know, if people don't bite, that's fine. But like, give it at least a handful or so and see where that goes. Because at first, it's probably going to be crappy. Yeah, I think it's also important to like talk about stuff you enjoy. Like, if you have a subject you don't care about, or you're just doing it for marketing, and like you don't actually want to be there, it's it's going to show in the output. Like, you need to be somewhat engaged and interested in everything. Well, let's talk about something that you're all interested in, and that is the whiskey portion of the whiskey web and whatnot. Um, now, I hold the distinction here of being the one person who, I won't say I don't enjoy whiskey, but I've never really gotten into any sort of sippable uh, liquor of any type. So I know Tracy has a truly epic collection, some of which she brought with to render. Um, it, but it was only Blanton's. I was never into it until Blanton's, and then I was like, <sighs> stuff is delicious because i started making um amaretto sours uh jeff morgenthaler do you all know jeff morgenthaler mm, he's like a so. he's some uh, i don't know if you call the mixologist but he has oh, a book anyways sure. okay but jeff morgenthaler has this blog I, I drink it at a bar and then they were like yeah that's jeff morgenthaler's amaretto sour and i was like who's jeff morgenthaler and i looked him <laughs> up and he's just like guy who is he's really famous and he owns a bar in portland i think hmm. um we should have gone yep. yeah but his amaretto sour is really good so i encourage you all to go home and then you know my boyfriend at the time was like okay let's not keep using that i'm like but that's the one i like the most the blend oh, you know right because you're blending it and the price has gone up and he's like yeah, yeah. you're ruining it with the sour but this guy's fancy sour is probably good it was yeah. your gateway drug, essentially. And they're like, oh, well, OK, things can taste good. Let's start exploring that. But uh, then you tell me, then you tell me I can't have it because mm, it's rare. Which just makes I you want, want it more. more. Exactly. Yeah. And then I hunt it down. and. So it did you it. find each other as whiskey lovers? Did one of you have to convert the other? <laughs> uh, who's the question for? Oh, I, I, Robbie and for, Chuck. For Robbie and Chuck, yeah. Oh, did, oh, did you I didn't find each that. other as whiskey lovers? Uh, sorry, not this is not for Tracy and her boyfriend. So that might, <laughs> that might also be interesting as well. Her, so Tracy, feel free piece. to chime in uh, after. Her, Tracy's married, so that's her side piece, yeah. I guess. Um, <laughs> no, I, we found each other through technology and just happened to have a mutual love of that. But I think that uh, I made Robbie's experience better because he would just dump whiskey on, on crushed ice and... I was like, well, yeah. what are you even having this for? You could just, you could have anything, right? Like, don't, don't bother putting decent no, stuff in there because it's, it's just watered down. It's the down. same as making cocktails with something fancy. Like, yeah. it's still better than if you threw Jack Daniels on ice. Like, you know, so it's, yes, I agree with you now that like watering it down immediately is not the best option, but um, it's still better than if you had watered down like bottom shelf stuff. So like, okay, I'll give you that. Yeah. It's fair. Um, we came together in technology and then discussed our uh, our mutual love of the brown juice and uh, through the podcast have been able to taste a lot of things. Although I was very much into whiskey things uh, for many years, was in clubs and traded and all of that stuff before whiskey got insane and uh, very hard to procure and afford on a regular basis. So, um, yeah, that was kind of the, the start of all of that, though. Do you, do you, do you both do it like wine bottles like are you are you working through one and then when it's done you just get a different one or are, are you are you hoarders did you do a little bit and then you go find a new one and just I, building I, up that collection bit by bit yeah i used to be the latter um now more the former just the because of how much we end up with it's sort of like i can't store all of this stuff so find myself like sticking to one bottle so i can get through it uh yeah. before moving on to some of the others and give some away, share with friends, all of that kind of thing. There's probably more of that happening now just because the sheer volume of, you know, four a month. Uh, yeah. 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 I've purchased more more. so much of it. Four a month? What's four a month? Oh, like through the podcast. Yeah, through the podcast. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And then any personal finds. And then, like, it's just, yeah. you know, four to six bottles of whiskey a month. And I don't consume them all, probably most of them. But, yeah. 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 I just drink the little bit for the podcast and then leave it. Like I don't really come back to them. So, uh, so you have like, uh, you have a whole wall then. Yeah, I have like you know hundred or so bottles. Nice. Um, yeah. So. 100th so. Episode. 
Yeah. You should I mean, label all of them. Label mm. all of them with the episodes. That'd be so cool. We have said well, we need to like go while. back and catalog what we've reviewed and do a better job yeah. of like get the ratings. Yeah. 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 yeah we need and to. And then build a dashboard in Ember, <laughs> an internal <laughs> dashboard, of course. Right. There well, you go. it's it's unfortunate actually. Our uh, our site is in Next.js because Tailwind <laughs> ships Next.js and their uh, <laughs> UI components by default. So it's like I don't have the time to build this. So. I still have some uh, running websites in Ember. Still running in Ember. See, it's just fine. Yeah, Probably like works. version two point whatever. Oh my god! I should Google it and see. <laughs> yeah, they're on version five now. So. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm not even on five yet. On, I guess. I guess Swatch is almost on five. It just had like an add-on that didn't work with it. <laughs> hmm. So what is teaching vanilla HTML like in the whiskey world? Uh, so, you know, if for someone uninitiated, what, uh, how should they learn? How should I learn? What, what's, what's the first bottle that I should, that I should get? Uh, well, what, what is it that you've had that you think is okay now? I'd start there. What have you already had that you're like, I don't know that this I've had bad. anything. You don't think you've had any whiskey something. whatsoever? Well, yeah. like, it's like a Jack and Coke, right? Like, sure, that's whiskey. Like that I basic. Mean, right. right. So you're yeah. always like kind of covering it up. Well, I mean, I would start by trying things um, in, in, you know, just right out of the bottle to sip something, get it at a, at a bar, you know, just try a few different things. I think you'd mentioned offline that you're an IPA guy. And for whatever reason, IPA people tend to love scotch especially like um like you like the hops and beer okay you're gonna love the peat and scotch and they will just like I chase like that peat stuff. Uh, that or or peaty smoky or peaty like yeah. go find one of those and and try that i would say but also like you know some simple very obtainable things like try maker's mark try buffalo trace try things in that fairy buffalo trace. Job, you can come over yeah, there you go. Go over to Tracy's and yeah. try a few things. That That is a great way, though. You'll have some friends with a few things. But you want them to... This, this isn't like one of those things, like, though. Like, like, you got to start at the top. No. That'll be the best experience. I don't think like, you'll mm -hmm. know no. that it is great or not until you kind of know where your tastes lie. Because, right, when you say whiskey, there's this huge world of different whiskeys. There's Japanese whiskeys. There's scotch. There's bourbon. There's rye. There's all um, uh, American single malts. There's a billion different things. So you just kind of need to find it around action that that yeah. speaks to you lean in there for a while then expand your palate all right so Rob, we're gonna see each other soon so i'll bring over the art bag <laughs> i'll bring over the log of Ulan, i'll bring over the left right there you go we'll start with that and she's also <laughs> going to bring a camera to film every one of my reactions <laughs> as i take a sip that so. makes sense and then if you follow us on social media be ready for that uh, i am ready i was gonna say i'm gonna look out for only that. if you wear wait. a power rangers outfit Whoa. Uh, <laughs> Which color Power Ranger? Last time he wore the red Power Ranger outfit, or was it green? It was the it red. Was, green. Hmm. was it green? It's even anyway. yeah, no, I, I think somebody else had the red one because that was the one that had the full over the top, and so they yeah. had no neck in the outfit. Oh yeah, he wore the green. The kids' you Power Ranger green. costume it was hilarious. Yeah. Oh, it was a kids' one. Okay, this no, is yeah, this is getting better. One. No, Jay Phelps, like. You know, has more, Ben has worn it too. I rest my case. I haven't washed it. I said what I said. <laughs> <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> I was going to say, this is, this is, at first I was going to say, this isn't getting better for you, but it is getting better for me. So. <laughs> it's we started drinking. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, unfortunately, this is where we're going to have to leave it here for today. So thank you for listening to this Modern Web Meets the Whiskey Web and Whatnot podcast for today. Thank you to our guests, Robbie and Chuck. As always, we say the conversation does not stop here. You can find Robbie on Twitter or X at <laughs> Robbie the Wagner. That's R O B B I E T H E W A G N E R. You can find Chuck on Twitter at how do you how do you phoneticize this? Is this Charles W the third? Yeah. That's it. Oh, and, and I you see just now I see your full name right now. It wasn't on Twitter, so I didn't know where the W was coming in at, but I now see it on screen here. Uh, so Charles W. the third, that's C-H-A-R-L-E-S-W-T-H-E, the number three, R-D. Tracy is on Twitter at Lady Leet, and you can find me online at RoboCell. As for the podcast, you can find us online at moderndotweb.com or on Twitter at modern.web. And of course, one last thank you to and message from our sponsor, this.labs, 
Approach your most pressing tech challenges with confidence, leveraging this.lab's tailored development strategies. Trusted by industry giants like Meta, Google, and T-Mobile, they specialize in bridging business and technology gaps, modernizing legacy systems, and ensuring sustainable application architecture. Discover how this.labs can empower your organization at this.co. Again, that's T-H-I-S D-O-T dot C-O. Thanks so much, Robbie and Chuck, for being here, and we'll see the rest of you next time.